For me, it's a huge privilege to be here on um, this auspicious occasion, on the, on the 50th anniversary of the Club of Rome. Um, interestingly, I don't know whether somebody has already mentioned, it's also the 50th anniversary of um, Robert Kennedy's speech on, on the GDP, so it's a very opportune uh, moment to be talking about the economy and going beyond the economy. Um, 50 years ago, Aurelia Page and Alexander King invited a small group of people to a quiet villa here in Rome to discuss what they called the predicament of humanity. Actually, they called it the predicament of mankind. Um, but given the new days and indeed the new consciousness and indeed the more egalitarian way of approaching uh, even the Club of Rome, um, I think we should call it the predicament of humanity. But the challenge remains how to reconcile the aspirations of humankind with the limits of the natural world. And I want to just reflect a little bit, although we're going to talk very seriously about the finance sector and about economics, I just want to reflect briefly on that question of, of limits, because it is an absolutely fascinating one. Ancient wisdom often saw limits not as an obstacle, but as a, a foundation for prosperity. Limitations are troublesome, but they are effective, wrote Richard Wilhelm in his 1923 translation of the I Ching. In nature, there are fixed limits for summer and winter, day and night, and those limits give the year its meaning, he said. Contemporary perspectives are far more likely to view limits as inconvenient or even illusory. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin once remarked that our duty as human beings is to proceed as if limits to our ability did not exist. And that view of essentially limitless creativity has been reinforced further by extraordinary advances in technology since de Chardin was writing. It began to seem that almost anything was possible, any resource constraint surmountable, any utopian vision for humanity achievable. Former US President Ronald Reagan, appealing to the same idea once proclaimed in response to the Club of Rome's first report, that there are no great limits to growth because there are no limits to the human capacity for intelligence, imagination, and wonder. And it's worth examining this assertion a bit more closely precisely because it conveys a partial truth. There are some unlimited aspects to human existence. Ingenuity, creativity, wonder may well be amongst those. And it certainly makes sense to recognize abundance when we find it. But there's also a fallacy in the claim. A system is not limited by its most abundant elements, but by its scarcities, the reality of 1.5 degrees, for example, is, turns out to be one of those places where limits matter. The disappearance of its wetlands, of its forests and its habitats in relation to this finite world. So our task, the task of understanding the predicament of humanity, it seems to me, turns out to depend upon the relationship between the limited and the limitness. That's our intellectual challenge. It's a challenge that I reflected on as Elizabeth was playing. The piano keyboard is limited. The piano itself is limited. The creativity of the player is unlimited. The enormous creativity of Chopin when he was writing is an extraordinary feat. He was half my age by the time he died. And he'd created wonders that still touch millions of people today. There is the unlimited capacity of human creativity all performed through the limited apparatus of a pianoforte. It's quite an extraordinary thing to contemplate, and in some ways is the foundation for a different kind of economy. What sort of economy do we want? I believe we should converge on that question from several different perspectives. Firstly, perhaps from the perspective of vision, an economy that works for everyone, not just for the privileged few. Delivering what it is that people need to live well, not just to live well, but to pursue that limitless creativity, to have their own opportunities to create, to define, to build, to teach, to write, to enjoy 
the wonders of the planet on which we live. That task itself, of course, requires a bit more elaboration. It's wonderful to have a vision, but we have to, as it were, reach into the toolbox of economics, take out its most precious concepts, and ask whether they are indeed fit for purpose in relation to that broader vision. Enterprise, for example. Can we really afford to think of it as a profit-maximizing material throughput system uh, which continually aims to persuade people to consume as much as possible without any regard for the fragility of the material resources on which that system is based? No, clearly we can't, and I don't expect that anyone here would suggest that we should, but we need a concept of enterprise to put in that place. And the one that I have worked with and feel has a lot of value is the idea of enterprise as services. It is, after all, the services that we provide to and for each other that creates the value in society, the service that Elizabeth just provided for us, the service that doctors and nurses provide in hospitals, the services that teachers provide in schools and universities. And that idea, actually, of enterprise as service has a transformative power in thinking about the economy. It's a way of saying this old concept around which we built economy is no longer fit for purpose, but here is something that will. And with that same logic, you can go through a number of the other bits of the economy. Work, for example. Work is seen as a form of drudgery, ill-paid, a cost to the ent entrepreneur. But actually, work is the most fundamental form of participation in society. The reward of labor is life, said William Morris once or take investment, the most fundamental relationship in economics. Fundamental because it's about our commitment to the future. Investment in the financial crisis became a kind of gambling casino in which the winner takes all and the social costs were passed on for generations and generations. But investment truly understood is in fact a commitment to the future. We can take these economic concepts, even the concept of money itself, which might seem to have become so corrupted, and turn them on their heads and argue, for example, that money is in fact a social good. It's part of how we exchange services in the economy. It's part of how we reward those who participate in, the, in society itself through their own work. These are tasks that are pre precise, definable, pragmatic, I would say. But clearly, we still have to put them together in some kind of economics. What kind of economic principles should govern this new set of precepts about what economics is? Just to give you one example, in a slower economy with more focus on services, it turns out to be essential to rethink the conventional assumption that we should only be rewarded to the extent of the speed with which we can work, the productivity of, of work. And that's particularly true if we are to avoid escalating inequality. It's particularly true if we are to value the work and the sacrifice of the doctors and the teachers and the nurses, because asking them to work faster and faster, to see more and more patients, to have bigger and bigger classroom sizes, to ask Elizabeth to play, to play Chopin's um, piano concertos faster and faster each year makes no sense whatsoever. And yet our economy as it stands is driven by this idea that productivity growth should determine not just the macroeconomic context of the economy, but even how we reward people in society. Slow really is sometimes much, much better. How do economics behave when they're no longer growing exponentially? That's been the focus of my work over the last decade with Peter Victor and many others. And our answers have sometimes been surprising even to ourselves. For example, the long troublesome question of whether an economy has to grow because you're charging interest on money, which for many years ecological economists believed was the case, turns out under a closer examination not to be the case. And you might ask, why did we not understand that before? 
And the reason is because we weren't really asking those kinds of questions. We weren't asking questions about a low growth economy. We weren't asking questions about a stationary state economy. Some, of course, clearly were Herman Daly, most notably amongst them. But we see our legacy as essentially beginning to ask those tough questions about an economy that doesn't behave in the way that 99% of the macroeconomists and politicians think that it should. An economy actually that is delivering well-being to people rather than delivering endless productivity growth in pursuit of continuing output that is creating devastation on our planet. But there's one further task, one last task, I think, to be addressed if we are to take the Club of Rome's mandate seriously. The US author Wendell Berry once suggested that our human and earthly limits, properly understood, are not confinements, but rather inducements to fullness of relationship and meaning. What would it mean if we took that invitation seriously? Some of our work, the work that I lead, in CUSP, the Center for the Understanding of Sustainable Prosperity, is beginning to identify some fascinating possibilities there. And they're not particularly new. They are about creativity and ingenuity and skill and musicianship and artistry. And I, as I see it, what we're doing is we're testing the richness of an old idea, the very real possibility that breaking free from the iron cage of a restless consumerism actually offers us wide new vistas in the progress of the human spirit. The new predicament of humanity, no longer a radical vision whispered by a marginal fringe, but an essential vision of social progress in a post-crisis world. A world in which everyone actually should have and deserve the opportunity to fulfill their creative potential. And that's Above everything, I think, is the predicament that persists. The predicament for the next 50 years of the Club of Rome should entirely be built around an egalitarian approach to that idea of the fulfillment of the human spirit. Thank you very much.